been a thanks to um, the Council of British Archaeology for inviting me along today. And I've got, I've got the names on here of my colleagues. Ollie Davis is my colleague who's actually the archaeologist. So uh, I'm not an archaeologist. I'm a medieval historian by trade, um, but I'm very involved in what we call in the university civic mission, which basically means doing all the community outreach stuff and community working uh, and, and working very closely with external organisations as well to deliver a kind of social mission of the university. But as I say, I am a medieval historian as well. And I've got a bit of archaeology in my background way back in the 90s when I was doing a degree. But Ollie is the archaeologist on the project uh, and he's an, um, an Iron Age specialist. Um, and he can't come tonight and he was going to be here, but he's actually in the middle of the dig at the moment. So he sends his apologies to you all. And I've also included Dave Horton and you'll know hear more about Dave and um, his uh, organisation, Action in Cairo and Neely, which is the community organisation we've worked really closely in partnership with. So that's just to explain why those names are there. Um, but what I'd really like to talk to you uh, about, about to you tonight is... Uh, I'm going to talk to you about archaeology, but I'm going to talk more really about my side of things, which is the community engagement side of things, or in fact, indeed, community participation side of things. And I'd like to talk about the significance of what we call co-producing archaeological and historical research, working really, really in close partnership, almost embedded within the communities um, that we work with to think and to think as well about the ways in which valuing local heritage and amazing local archaeology and collective discovery of that past, the way in which that, um, if you like, has the power to create all sorts of things really, but you know, new and really positive life-changing opportunities. Um, and indeed, to, to some extent, perhaps, uh, you know, things around community re regeneration uh, as well. And to illustrate that, I'm going to be talking to you about the project that Ollie and I and Dave have been involved in for 12 years now, which is um, called the Kaya Heritage Project. Um, and Kaya is an interesting word, C-A-E-R. Um, it actually, if you only just ask me a minute ago, is that an acronym? Because it sounds like one. And it, it, it is actually, um, for us as a project, it stands for the Kaira and Ely, which are the communities we work in, Rediscovering Heritage Project. But Kaya, if you're not from Wales, is a, is, is a, is a quite a, an, an important and powerful word. And you'll see it in lots of place names. So Kaya Deeth and Kaya Leon and, and places you may have heard of are prefixed by this word Kaya. Um, which is a Welsh word, probably with a Britonic origin, which really means, well, it's it's often interpreted as fort um, or kind of defended place. But really, um, within the context of what we're talking about and in the context of Iron Age um, occupations, um, Kaya, you know, is a defended place. It's a community. It's a defended community. Uh, it's not a fort. It's not a military installation in that kind of sense. It's a community that kind of defines itself um, through physical um, uh, defences, but they also are symbolic, perhaps, defences as well, and they bring people together to create them. So, Kaya is at the heart of um, uh, of our project, and and indeed the, one of the, the places that we work at is called Kaira, which means forts. Literally, uh, it's a plural of that, and so the name is embedded in the community as well. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about the communities because um, they are so super important to everything that we do. Um, so Kyra and Ely are on the west of Cardiff. If you've ever been to Cardiff um, and headed out on the main road, A48 out, you'll have driven through Kyra and Ely. Um, and they constitute really one of the largest social housing estates in Wales. Um, they certainly were uh, at one time, I think, one of the largest social housing estates in the UK. Located on the uh, western edge of the capital and home to around uh, 26,000 people. So, you know, they're really, really big suburbs. Um, and they're sort of divided into the north um, there, the Ely side um, is the north side, which is the North Ely estate built on garden village principles, um, designed in the 1920s and built in the 1930s um, as the kind of homes for heroes, um, uh, if you like, returning from um, the, the First World War and the trenches. And indeed, there are Commonwealth War graves at the cemetery you can see there um, uh, in that part of Ely. And then south is a, another large social housing estate, um, uh, which is kind of a bit more fragmented, but a big part of it was built in the wake of in the reconstruction after the Second World War. So um, 
So these are communities that, um, you know, they, they were visions of, of uh, a housing estate, you know, the, the Garden Village principles of the housing estate, beautiful, you know, turnpike streets, lots of playgrounds, nice houses with, you know, good facilities and stuff like that, schools. And, you know, they were a vision of, of social housing and a vision of the future at the time when they were when they were built. And they were serviced um, um, by really big industries, which were quite close um, up the top there. I don't know if you can see the cursor up here, there were some big industries there where there was a huge paper mill there, um, uh, which um, created the paper for um, uh, newspaper print right across the UK and, and parts of Europe. And um, that uh, employed something like about 8,000 people, I think, or even more at one point, had its own swimming pool and stuff. And then there was also a brewery, um, the Ely Brewery, which made Ely Bitter. Um, and there was a jam factory, Chivers Jam Factory. So these these industries were there, and um, some had been there for, for quite some time, serviced the population until the 1970s and the 1980s, when all of those industries um, kind of disappeared during the period of deindustrialization. And that in turn then led to some um, significant challenges for the communities of Cairo and Ely. And I don't want to dwell on this too much. I know Ely has been in the news of late um, due to very tragic events. Um, uh, and that's something that, you know, I'm going to talk a little bit about how we, that's something we, we in terms of the representations in the media is something that's quite important to our project and, and, and telling a different story. But, you know, there are challenges and it's important to recognise and acknowledge those challenges because they are a key part of our project and why we're there and what we are trying to, to do, really. Um, and those challenges include, you know, there are um, significant pockets of high unemployment, but actually um, I'm a trustee on um, the local community development organisation. And a bigger problem is actually poverty in work, people in very low paid and secure work who find it hard to make ends meet. And, and so that's a really big problem. Um, there are a range of like um, indices of poverty, if you like, that are associated with that. We have, you know, especially since the, 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 the pandemic, you know, think food poverty has increased. Um, we've had, you know, health and well-being is poorer, lower life expectancies. Um, and and, and uh, actually quite low, um, if you like, numbers of young people going into higher education, less than 7% from local schools going to higher education, which is a travesty. I mean, I work with those local schools, they're full of talent, um, but there's a whole range of reasons why that that's the case. So, you know, you have a lot of attendant um, uh, um, challenges there. And along with that as often with with you know with big social housing estates where you have challenges you then get a lot of stigma and stereotype um often per perpetuated in the media um around the nature of those communities and really focusing on all the negative aspects of those communities um but also stereotypes that are sometimes held locally within other parts of the community um other parts of cardiff perhaps where you know you think oh i'm not going there because you know something's going to happen to me which is nonsense so these are unfounded, you know, these are unfounded stigmas and stereotypes. In a, uh, uh, and I can tell I can tell you that quite honestly from having worked in these communities for a long, long time. What they are, though, is communities that are just full of friendship, full of warmth, full of solidarity and community activism and and a really strong sense of identity as well. Um, and that's something that we kind of really, really focus on um, and something else that they have, which is really quite incredible. I'm hoping you can see um, this, all the slides, it's a bit, bit complicated, but they have the most incredible heritage, um, uh, most incredible history, probably, you know, one of the richest uh, in Wales in terms of, uh, and we're finding more all the time. Um, and this also relates to specific sites within the community. So, um, there, you know, the modern story is really interesting in itself. I was talking there about the social housing estate. Well, that's really interesting. But there was also a big, great big race course, the Ely race course, which um, uh, where the Welsh Grand National was held up until the 1930s. And um, a lot of big buildings in Ely around by Ely Bridge are there because they were servicing the races and people used to come in on the train. Um, so and then that that site then became an early airstrip, an airfield. And Marconi, I think, did his first um, uh, air to uh, a ground radio transmission from the Ely, uh, um, airport. Then it was a you know it was a barrage balloon facility during the Second World War. So there's really interesting modern story in that big park called Chalai Park, and there's going to be more about that in a bit. 
But going back, um, you know, there's a really interesting medieval story at the site um, on the hill at Cairo. There's a, an interesting uh, bailey or medieval ringwork castle. And there's a, um, a beautiful medieval ch ruinous church called St. Mary's, which is in the Landaff Charters, dates to the 13th century. In the north um, of Ely, there's also uh, Michael's and Super Ely, which is the church you can see there. St. Michael's still for standing, similar date. Um, and uh, a, a deserted medieval village there, which we've excavated on that north side of Ely. Um, there's also an interesting, uh, really interesting early modern story. There was a battle, a civil war battle there. We found mux musket balls on the hill. Um, there was uh, a coaching house. There's some really interesting sources around that early modern story. And then going back further into deep time, you know, we found early medieval stuff on, uh, on the hill. Um, and um, there's also a Roman villa in Trifield, a very large Roman villa, and I'll say a little bit more about that in a bit. Um, but the jewel in the crown, perhaps, of the heritage is this incredible um, site here, which is uh, the entire hill is a monument, uh, and it's uh, an Iron Age hill fort, or Kaya. Um, uh, and if you've ever driven down from Culverhouse Cross down into the Cardiff Bay, you'll have gone through the, around the cutting that uh, snakes around this beautiful hill. Um, and that is the site of not only an Iron Age hill fort dating to about two and a half thousand years ago, which was, you know, really, really important um, community and centre, but also underneath that, um, uh, a, ne a Neolithic causeway enclosure, um, which, you know, which is packed full of archaeology dating back 6,000 years, where people were first gathering in the landscape in a, in a, in a, in a ritual kind of enclosure um, on top of the hill. Um, and indeed, there are also really interesting Bronze Age finds, not least ones we're looking at right now, but there was a really interesting hoard found along the Ely River there. So you've got every era you can think of. I'm in a school of history, archaeology and religion. Everything we study, you could tell the, you know, you could extrapolate from this community and tell that story. So it's very, very rich in the heritage and in the archaeology. And a lot of that we've discovered together with the community in recent years. So I'm going to say a little bit more about the hill fort. So this is a nice aerial photo of the hill fort there. Um, and as I said, you know, it was a it's a it's a very substantial um, hill fort. It's 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 it, on this spit of land that you can see coming out there from the Vale of Glamorgan. The entrance is kind of face up into the Vale of Glamorgan, the higher land there where perhaps people were farming in in the Iron Age. But it dominates the Cardiff Basin, and and this would have been a very important and powerful community in the Iron Age. Um, two and two and a half thousand years, two two and a half thousand years ago, or two thousand years ago up to that about the time who really were, this is the original Cardiff. This is the original Cardiff. This is where people were living. Before the Romans come and everything kind of moves down to where Cardiff Castle is now, um, uh, this is the power centre. And isn't that an interesting story to tell for communities that are seen to be, you know, well, it's marginally marginal in the sense that it's on the edge of Cardiff, but also marginalised socially and economically. So to discover that, that this is the power centre and your community was the power centre, I think is a powerful story to tell. To give you a sense of the scale of this monument, this is the LIDAR or laser scan survey um, where we've just literally stripped away all the houses and the trees. And you can see these enormous uh, ditches and banks, um, multi lake going around, three of them going right the way around that spit and then two entrances and then an enormous massive um, great big rampart joining those two entrances and then in the corner there you can see a little ring that at the top there that's the castle that was built much later the medieval castle that was built inside the Iron Age Hall Fort so this is like you know this is a community who've come together thousands of people probably to create this sculpture in the landscape to create their kaya to create their their community as they build it and um and you know it is really really a, a very impressive monument and what did it look like well you know this is a lovely picture by penny one of our volunteers who this is what she thinks um uh it, it you know it may have looked like with you know um the ramparts covered in trees they wouldn't have been then the houses now crowd around the outside back then the roundhouses would have crowded inside and would have been visible probably for miles and that's a story we've discovered with local people through the archaeology. 
So I want to talk a little bit now about um, uh, the ways in which we've discovered that, and then I'll talk a little bit about the archaeology. But really what I want to talk about is the ways that we've kind of built this really quite exciting partnership with, with the community. And fundamental to this have been a community development organisation called ACE, who, uh, which means Action in Cairo and Ely. And ACE grew out of a Welsh government initiative called Communities First, which was uh, an initiative that was helping, uh, you know, investment in communities that were facing social and economic challenges. But ACE soon kind of grew beyond that and that programme has finished now. Um, but basically, it's an organisation made up largely of local people is about 70 percent of the organisation um, and they are really fundamentally about kind of coming together to try to address those social and economic challenges um, that I, I talked about but from within um, rather than being seen as a kind of problem community to be solved and you know kind of people just coming and doing stuff it's about kind of growing um, through what they call an asset-based community development uh, approach looking at all the good things in the community and all the assets and all the fantastic stuff that people have got in terms of their talents and the heritage and creativity and using that to address some of these really really quite significant um, social and epic uh, uh, economic problems and the kinds of work that ACE do are very very broad so uh, and I know this because I'm a trustee there so they, it or, or was until very recently so you know obviously I've talked about food poverty I've talked about unemployment and and poverty in work so there's a lot of support around those things they also do a lot of uh, you know they do youth work there's a lot of work around well-being and people's um, you know uh, helping people with, with their mental health and stuff like that as well loads of arts and creativity lots of kind of gardening they have a kind of skills men shed thing where they make stuff there's a brilliant thing called the library of things where they just got like a library of stuff that you loan out so if you want to go on holiday in a tent they've got all the tent and the camping gear and they'll loan that out um to, to people who maybe can't always afford to that to, to do that um you know help and support around everything you can imagine um and and we are if you like just one strand of that through Kaya Heritage. We're just one of their key key projects. And we've learned an awful lot from them as an organization. Obviously, as from Cardiff University, we can bring other stuff. We can bring stuff about how to create new knowledge and our, our, our skills around archaeology and, and history. Um, we can bring in some university investment. We can bring in education and um, you know scholarships and, and, and all that kind of stuff. And we can make links with other universities as well. So that partnership really is dovetailed and really blended. And um, and we we kind of very much, Ollie and I spend a lot of time down in Ealing Kyra and working in ACE and we're very much embedded there. So we see all the other stuff that's that's kind of going on, but equally often Dave has come to things like this and, and, and presented with us in, in the university. So it's a what we call a two-way reciprocal kind of relationship. And we came together with ACE and we came together with a local school and we came together um, with local residents and the farmer um, about mm, nearly 12 years ago now um, and we knew that there, there was this incredible monument we didn't really know what it was going to how, how rich it was going to be but we knew it was going to be it was really important and we sat down and we talked about what can we do with that that asset that amazing heritage what can we do with that you know what are the challenges that are faced in the community um, and we we thrashed out these three underpinning project objectives which have seen us right ever since they've seen us go from getting tiny little bits of money to a big big lottery money and 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 creating some really special things and those were those objectives were to raise interest in discovering and valuing that past you know to and to really kind of connect with it in a visceral way that involves people in that discovery but equal to that was we really wanted to create new life and educational opportunities for everyone so it's that reciprocal thing. everybody that gets involved gets something out of it everybody makes new friends everybody does you know me and ollie learned as much from the communities as, as maybe some people in the communities have learned from the things we've done so everybody's getting different opportunities and and they're positive ones um and then the other key one and the, and you know this is even more profound in in the light of recent events was because you know there was previous civil, civil disturbance in Ely back in the 90s and that got regurgitated in the press time and time again and recently obviously uh, we've been trying to break a positive story out of Ely and Cairo and we've had some pretty 
positive stuff going on for for a long time but you know as soon as something negative happens the whole uk press jumps on it so we really want to challenge the negative stories and perceptions of Ely and kyra and tell a different story which actually is the story that we've experienced and the story that local people often experience as well despite those many challenges a story of solidarity community activism and people coming together to address their challenges so that's a really important part of our project and to do that we work with lots and lots of different people. We're very, very involved with schools, and I'll talk more about that in a bit. ACE I've mentioned as well. Obviously, local residents and volunteers, I'm going to talk about them too. Our students are involved in the project, and they'll get a mention. And a very important facet of our project has also been working with creatives, working with local artists and key artists who really have helped us to showcase some of the things we find and involve lots and lots of people. And we've done the things we've done by adopting Action Kyrie and Ely's community development approach, which is, yes, asset based, as I mentioned. And that always sounds a little bit too economic to me, but, you know, it's about positive based stuff. That's what it means. Um, but we've also done it through this strategy, which is termed a community development strategy, which some of you may be aware of, which kind of came out of the US in the 1970s called co-production. And initially this was a strategy designed to address a kind of deficit in, in, in civil uh, you know, services and, and, and services for people by people coming together to create their own um, solutions to those. But ultimately co-production as a strategy is a, is a fantastic way to approach community development it's also a fantastic way to approach archaeology and to approach discovering the past um, and what it involves are these key ingredients um, that you take that front foot you take that positive asset-based approach you look at the good things you look at the strengths that people have and you you focus on those that you value also equally everybody everybody's got something to bring to the project you know Everybody can get involved in doing a dig. Every, different people have different knowledge about about the local area. They have creative skills. Um, they they you know they can do all sorts of things. So everybody from Professor Sharples of uh, Cardiff University, who's a um, you know Iron Age professor, to to you know um, uh, Jamie, who's, who's you know um, was at the time a kind of primary school kid coming in and sit and sieving the spoil heaps and and discovering stuff. So everybody is valued equally, and the contributions of all are are valued. Um, long term involvement is key, and that's what we have managed to do through lots of different grants and through hard work and tenacity and through involving the right partners. Um, you need to build trust. Really, really, that's just the fundamentally most important thing in this kind of work is, is trust and friendship. And, and that means being on the ground and talking to people and getting involved and getting to know people, getting to know the problems people are facing and getting them involved. Um, and that goes alongside, obviously, developing social networks through face to face contact, which is a key point there. And then there's that whole thing of reciprocal and mutual benefit. So everybody's getting something out of it. Everybody's getting some ownership. Everybody's getting some skills. Everybody's getting something out of the, the processes of the co-production. Um, and, and, you know, and then everybody kind of really celebrates it. So when you do stuff like that, you can do things on a big scale because everybody's coming together. Um, so that's I just wanted to talk a little bit about that so you could see what it and what does it look like when it's in action this is a bit of an old slide now and it, I could update it would be way way more complicated than this now um, but uh, hopefully you can see so this is this is where we started so it's like us in School of History Archaeology and Religion um, Cardiff West Community High School the local high school was then called Glendary local residents and and ACE um, and then we brought, you know, a whole bunch of people, National Museum, CADU, other museums and heritage sector. ACE brought loads of different groups and different in, uh, community groups and people they were working with. The schools brought their feeder schools and other schools within the area. Local residents brought other friends, brought their key individuals, brought their community groups. Um, and then as we grew, other schools within our, our university got interested. So we had the School of Journalism, School of Social Sciences got involved, um, Centre for Lifelong Learning. And then other universities we got partnerships with and grants with, working with, you know, um, uh, them as well. And and then kind of it got messy and then connections were made and friendships were made and between different people through those connections and then it kind of became like and then it becomes really powerful because you've got this kind of super positive cycle going on so that's what co-production maybe looks like but you can't do anything without money right 
So uh, I thought I'd mention funding. So we, you know, when we started, Ollie and I'd never got a grant and, and we'd never done anything like this. And um, we started quite small. We had a little grant from the university, which enabled us to do some initial um, kind of scoping. And then we we managed to get tapped into the Arts and Humanities Research Council, which had this program called Collected Communities. And that was really important because it was about work researching with communities. And, um, and then we then, over a series of excavations, use that AHRC money um, to do the co-research, to invoke, to use all those co-production strategies to find and discover the past through archaeology and through history and, and to bring artists and creatives in. And that kind of took us up to about 20, 2015, 2016. There are a few extra grants as well. ACE brought in some in-kind grants, some Welsh Government grants, Arts Council Wales. But we got so far but then, you know, we can't really do anything. So you've got what we discovered was that Cairo Hillfort is probably the oldest. Uh, yeah, is the oldest and certainly one of the biggest monuments in Cardiff. Up the road, you've got St. Fagans Museum, National Museum, Mount Gruffa Cymru, 600,000 visitors a year, less than two miles away. If you go into the centre of Cardiff, you've got Cardiff Castle and all the amazing heritage sites there. But they've got all this infrastructure interpretation, you know, people, capacity. Nothing here to celebrate the original power centre, the original Cardiff. Um, nothing for the local people to have a, a sort of focus on for that. So we went for a National Lottery Heritage Fund grant. And that grant wasn't to be held by the university, as the previous grants had been. We flipped it. ACE went for that grant and the university acted in support. And, the, and that grant was held and run by ACE as a small community development organisation to really create a new amazing new center and allow people to come and access and visit the center and create that so i'm going to talk about that in a bit so i'm going to say no more about that at the heart of what we do is archaeology you'll all be pleased to hear um and uh as you all know if you've ever been on an excavation an archaeological dig creates a community um uh, it creates friendships it creates things friendships that last a long time sometimes between people you didn't think would be friends and um it you know it's a great way to do that kind of trust building and and and, and on the ground and so digs have been at the heart of our our, our strategy right the way through the project even from the get-go um, and our first big community dig was in 2013 and we've done eight and we're on our eighth currently happening today uh, and started this week um uh uh, uh and i'll talk about that in a, in a uh, before i finish uh hopefully if i can get through everything so the digs are really fantastic because they bring community together of all ages. We we open a we we run a really open access as far as we can policy. So we kind of try to involve. We have hundreds, literally thousands of community volunteers have been involved and working alongside. We've had young people coming up after school come up and get involved in sieving spoil heaps and all that sort of stuff. It's just a brilliant community kind of um, endeavour um, every time we do a dig, and it's happening again right now, and it's really exciting. And we also bring our students. So our students are there. Some of them come locally, but some of them are come from different communities. So that's about kind of breaking down barriers to higher education as well, because our community, our students working inside, alongside local young people, getting them thinking about coming to university, perhaps. Um, we also bring in lots of visitors from other parts of Cardiff, and sometimes they volunteer. So they come to Cairo and Ely and they see, oh, actually, these communities are really safe and they're really welcoming and warm. And like, you know, what's all that nonsense I've heard about them about? So it's about bringing people. So the digs are really, really important for all that. They're also really, really important for um, discovering. And, and you know, the, the excavations um, we've had have discovered such an incredible story. We went uh, onto the hill, uh, Cairo Hill, looking for the Iron Age in um, the digs in 2013, 2014 and 2015. We found evidence of dense you know population on the hill and uh i think it's about five roundhouses um all together and lots of other little and a, a rubbish pit which was full of 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 stuff that um, told us about the way people were living and the animals they were keeping and stuff like that but we also found quite a lot of roman stuff on the hill which was a surprise we didn't expect that it looks like the when the romans come and we know they build this great big villa in, in Ely in July Field, as I, I told you earlier. Um, but there are also, there are people living on the hill who take on Roman culture and potentially we don't even know there may, there's something funny going on there in the Roman period. There's, there's a piece of rolled lead, which may be a curse 
um, there's a kind of trackway that goes around the inside of the, the hill fort and there's there's lots and lots of pottery so we don't know if it might even be a, a temple or something like that a temple site there's an interesting medieval story and i touched on earlier how we just dug a deserted medieval village and we've geophysed the the medieval ringwork on the hill as well um and um the, the real kind of, you know, surprise was when we found very, very rich Neolithic finds on the hill in, in 2014 and 2015. Um, and we found this causeway enclosure, which I mentioned earlier, which is this kind of ritual site. Um, 6,000 years, some of the, you know, loads of pottery, more than, you know, it's a really rich for pottery for a Welsh site from Neolithic pottery. And that got reported in the United States. So you can see it's breaking really positive stories because the community were huge parts of all of those discoveries. And, you know, people like Jeff here, people like Jackie, all the people we've involved over many, many years, and I'll give you some of their voices later. So the dig's really important, and we've discovered this incredible story that stretches back to the Neolithic, and there's Bronze Age too, and I'll get to that in a minute. But a big part of what we've done is, is really focused, and I touched on this earlier, is focused on working with young people as well. A lot of adults get involved in the digs and all sorts of things we do, but we have a really close relationship with the school. We started with them. Um, and we've done a whole range of projects that are about hopefully trying to break down barriers to higher education, but also giving local young people new opportunities to work with university people and loads of other heritage professionals. Um, work around social cohesion as well. We've had young people from the schools we work in in Ely and Cairo working with it, um, more kind of um, southern inner city school um, Fitzalan where traditionally there have been tensions between young people um, underpinned by sort of racial tensions um, and we brought them together quite recently there's a great project called Roman Diff where two lots of year eights came together and made friends and and spent a whole term exploring the Roman kind of past in Cairo and Ely. Um, we've had um, projects, you know, the, lots of workshops being delivered in schools. Schools get involved in the dig, so they come along and have a formal dig experience and they'll get to do everything. We let them dig where the digs, where the stuff, not just, you know, a sand pit. Um, they get to find things, they get to sieve, they get to um, uh, wash the finds, they get to do some artifact analysis. Um, and, you know, a whole range. We've done, we've even done uh, schools projects looking at the modern history of the Ely estate. They went into the Glamorgan archives, looked at all the records from the 1920s of the garden village houses, um, the beautiful architects drawings. And then they went and interviewed um, uh, a, a group of elderly people who were the first kids on the Ely estate when it was brand new and took oral histories. And we had an exhibition that came out of that. Um, so working with that heritage side of things and then Having those those exhibitions is really important, and we often have them in the Museum of Cardiff, which is right in the heart of Cardiff, so that people from the rest of Cardiff can come and see these incredible stories of, from Ely and Kyra and, and share in them. Adult learning has also been a key part of our project, and we um, have embedded lots and lots of courses um, often free, in fact, mostly free courses, a program called Live Local, Learn Local. That, and, and those courses are great because they do things that actually create things that go back into the projects and back into the community. So there's creative writing courses around creating an animation that we use. Um, one group of, young, of, of people came together and got to see all the finds from Ely and Cairo that are buried in the Mas National Museum of Wales and then created their own exhibition, which went to the Museum of Cardiff, another exhibition. But I think it's about a thousand people came to see that in a week. Um, and, um, you know, we have guard projects on weaving, creating Iron Age cloaks, so craft and gardening. Um, so, you know, and, and then we also have people who've gone on from some of those projects into our pathways into degrees in university, people like Doug here, who's um, gone on to a degree. We've got Scott currently digging with us, who's come through that same route onto degrees um, uh, as well. And I should have mentioned we have scholarships for young people from Cardiff University, too. So we're currently every year giving out two scholarships for young people to come and study at Cardiff University with 50% um, of their fees paid to help break down financial barriers. Um, and currently, and that's not just in archaeology, they can come and do, um, we've currently got Lauren doing law and Cameron doing law. Um, so the scholarship programme is there and embedded in the project as well for local young people. And that's very much thanks to Cardiff Uni. I can see I'm running out of time here, but I'm going to try and battle on. Um, there's a lot to tell you, but um, I'm kind of uh, getting through the thick of it now, I think. 
I did want to talk about the role of artists because artists, as I mentioned at the start, have been so important. Um, right from the start of the project, we involved an artist called Paul Evans. He's actually from Sheffield. Um, he'd been an artist in residence with us at our school. But Paul's been absolutely amazing and he's been a kind of real driving force in getting um, not just in, in, in kind of creating really creative ways of showcasing incredible heritage and getting people's voices heard um, uh, in, through all sorts of mediums um, uh, from the local community, but also in actually um, getting some of the funding and, 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 and helping us to think creatively about how we, we do things in, in that respect. And he's been joined since 2016 by local artist Nick Parsons, who's absolutely incredible. And she's currently at the dig site as well, um, doing um, uh, loads of creative art artwork and, and stuff. And so we embed artwork into the excavation. And indeed, our first um, uh, ever project was where we got local young people to design their own tribal logos. Um, uh, we, they learned about the Iron Age. They designed these fab logos, you know, like if it's Nike, but they'd be there. What would their Iron Age tribe logo be? And then they um, they took they designed them and then they took them up beneath the large rampart on the hill. And then they scaled them up on a massive scale and laid them out in bark in biodegradable bark, a kind of eco graffiti, because there were issues with graffiti at the site, and we wanted to turn that into a positive. And those those um, logos stayed, and they just biodegraded away. And one of them, our logo, the horse's head shield that you've seen, that was chosen by the local farmer Ralph because he said, "I like." We asked him of all these six logos, which one should be our our project logo, and he said that one because my horses go in the field. Um, and that kind of sums up, you know, what the art can do. It it creates that kind of amazing kind of connection and uh, a way of kind of really bringing people together to co-create a beautiful piece of art that actually showcases the heritage as well and since then we've had a whole range of things from performances to animations check out Kaya Heads if you ever get a chance there's a brilliant animation where local people tell their stories of Ely and Kyra through uh, clay heads that we all made on a dig during a lunchtime um, and then they get animated and like creature comforts and they talk to you and they're, 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 you can see one at the top there. They're literally laid on the grass of the dig site um, and talking to you from there. I think it's the only ever animation that's been done from an archaeological site that's been created at an archaeological site. So very, very important to have the artists involved. But most important of all, absolutely fundamental to everything that we do from the start have been local people and volunteers, especially. Um, literally thousands of people have been involved in the excavations over the 10 or 12 years we've been going in the eight excavations. But not just that, they've been involved in creating all those pieces of artwork. Um, they've been involved in, in loads of things. And now we have our Heritage Centre, they're involved in all sorts of things, you know, from kind of clearing the snow and and collect and and litter picking to coppicing and creating trails, creating incredible tapestries and works of art that go into the centre, renovating or preserving the buildings. This is a beautiful St Mary's Church. I don't know if you guys can see that there, uh, the ruin of St Mary's Church with a turf um, topping that we did um, with uh, Society for Protection of Ancient Buildings, a great project involving volunteers and all of the digs as well. And we really just couldn't have done. And the stuff that we've done and the scale of the project just couldn't have happened without all of those thousands of people, all of that brilliant talent, all of those amazing people in Cairo and Ely, whose stories never get told because you just hear the, you know, the bad stories, you know, none of that would have happened. And none of our project would have happened without, without them. So, you know, just from the heart, that's the, the, the most important part. I did want to touch on this. I won't go on about this too much. What do you do when you can't bring everybody together in your community? Um, you know, this is what happened, isn't it, with the pandemic? And um, our response to this was um, was our back garden digs. So uh, in 2020, we were going to do a dig, a community dig, and obviously we couldn't. Um, so we decided um, to sort of riff off um, some other stuff that had happened in the media. Uh, Michael Wood's great series, um, the Kibworth dig, I think it was, wasn't it? Um, but we did it in Ely and Kyra. You know, we did it um, in... Uh, you know in in the communities that we work in um and it was it went huge you know 39 households took part um they excavated this is jeff in his back garden uh, with his kaya t-shirt on um and dylan i think it is uh, the young lad there um excavating his back garden and um you know 
uh, some incredible finds came out. You know, a lot of it was modern, as you'd imagine. Some really great and fascinating stuff from the um, the modern estates. But we found flint in pretty much all of those gardens, and that wasn't there naturally. So that tells us that you know, in the Neolithic, people were all over the whole community. Um, and there was some, I think, Iron Age and Roman pottery that came out. And wonderfully, Carenza Lewis, um, who has been connected to our project um uh over a number of years came in and did a kind of time team style video di uh, video meet the archaeologists and people were able to bring their uh, virtually bring their finds and show Carenza um and all of that we've sterilized the tools so they went out and it was all safe um and you know and we also did a food um poverty project around that as well where we had delivered we um uh, heritage food recipes to to households as well so that you know, we still managed to keep it going. Actually, Jeff says that was one of the, his favourite things about the the project that we got involved in. So, and of course, that won us the uh, CBA Marsh Award uh, a couple of years ago. Thank you, CBA, for that. I'm running out of time. Right, I'll just quickly talk about the dig, and then very very briefly tell show you the Kaya Heritage Centre, which is absolutely beautiful. And then I'll finish. Um, so what are we doing now? Um, well, uh, we're back all together after the pandemic. We're able to um, excavate again. Um, and we've moved a little bit down about half a mile away. If you remember my map at the start, I showed you where the Roman villa was. And that's it there from the air. Um, in uh, It was excavated by a good old famous Mortimer Wheeler, who's obviously first archaeology in Cardiff, 1922. So that was before the Archira or Ely estates were built. It was all just fields. Um, and the, the finds reside in the National Museum of Wales. So we knew it, it had an interesting um, story to it, this um, particular location. But when a new school was built, a uh, beautiful new school, Cardiff West Community High on the site of the school, we actually had our first meeting in at Glendary High. Um, they were going to put some artificial football pitches in. So the area had to be geophysed. And um, Tim Young, our geophysicist who's worked on our project, discovered this enclosure you can see below the Roman villa. Um, which was, you know, remarkable. So Ollie said, well, you know, that's clearly a roundhouse in there. And that looks remarkably like the Roman villa, doesn't it? Um, similar shape. And um, so uh, we we've, we felt we, we needed to go and, and, and explore and excavate it. So we do a the whole area with local school kids. And um, and that's what we came up with. So we went there and Ollie thought it was going to be a late Iron Age site. He thought it was going to be late Iron Age. And that's why the Roman villa is there. And it's a kind of important site, maybe. And then, you know, people, um, uh, the Romans come and, and it kind of gets disused. Oops. But very early on. Sorry, there we go. We found a very different story. story. Um, uh, we started to uncover, well, we have a lithic expert on the team, uh, Anna, and we started to uncover um, what looked like uh, more, much more like Bronze Age work flints. Um, and uh, and it, it seemed to be much, much earlier, the other end, about a thousand years earlier. Um, and what we found was um, a, a huge uh, or significant Bronze Age enclosure with a great big uh, revetted uh, timber bank around it. Um, uh, and you can see the size of the post holes there and then a ditch, which is crammed full of, uh, you know, really interesting stuff like um, the Bronze Age flints and ceramics um, that were diagnostically uh, very Bronze Age, including this stellar find, this beautiful um, decorated mid Bronze Age pot, um, which was discovered um, again, all by the local community. So that again, allowed us to tell this really positive story. Again, hundreds of people were involved. This is, uh, there were three trenches. This is um, a trench two, I believe, which is which was had the terminus to the ditch. And we had an entrance there in that one. And then we've also got um, a round, a bronze age round chase with a floor. The floor is still intact, uh, which we're sampling. Um, so very rich in finds and very, very rare to get bronze age um, uh, house uh, as well. We knew that bronze age, activity in the area because of the hordes but not um not a house and where people were living and we're there now today they're out they're, they've literally started on monday um uh, and this is some early pictures we've got a nice shilling come up there and then you can see a bronze age flint there and the bottom right here's jackie uh, who i mentioned earlier getting involved already uh, on day two um cleaning the finds as they're starting to come out we've got glenn scott whole bunch of local people in there um uh, getting involved in a dig alongside our students in all of the heat um 
And there it is, you know, we get fab news coverage. And this is from last year, Cardiff Archaeological Dig and covers earliest house in city, earliest house in Cardiff and, and covered with the community. And, and that comes to the front. Um, and there we go. And that is a special one for you all. That came out today. Ollie sent me that just this afternoon. So we have a very early Bronze Age flint arrowhead coming from a pit, which uh, is just outside the house, um, uh, discovered. And I don't know if I, I would love to think that was a community member discovered that. I don't know who discovered it because I wasn't there today. So I'm just going to conclude now by just saying a little bit about our beautiful Kaya Heritage Centre. So I talked earlier about how we went for national lottery funding and we wanted to create um, a you know, to really kind of create a statement for the community and uh, about the importance of the monument and about the importance of them and their heritage and and all of their um, talent. Um, and we did so through a kind of, you know, tough um, uh, three, three or four year process of building a national lottery um, uh, grants and then delivering. Um, and we turned a beautiful gospel hall uh, which was really getting a bit, it was beautiful originally, but it was getting a bit ugly by the time we got hold of it. And we got, we had an, Ace got an asset transfer for an old building, um, but it was in a beautiful location because it's right at the bottom of the hill fort on Church Road, um, near to where all the trails go up and stuff. And we created um, this beautiful building, which is um, very much co-created with local people. We also um created a playground there was a there was a derelict playground there. there's a beautiful park land but you know it had been kind of vandalized years ago and then the, it had never been replaced because there's that stigma oh it's Cairo, it will you know just get wrecked again that's nonsense we've proven that to be true because this is our playground went in two years ago and it's still pristine and people come and litter pick it and it was designed by local people who went and looked at the heritage playgrounds and you'll see you've got the palisades there it reflects the iron age um, we got money from the local housing agency to do that, to get a really, really good um, uh, and um, uh, uh, playground designer to come in um, who worked with some faggins. And we've got these roundhouse features. These are like these like look like rampart slides. They're not actually the ramparts. They're um, it used to be a brickworks this bit, but they look like ramparts. So, you know, there's this beautiful um, um, playground. The building itself, this is the process we work with the architects, all of these working groups, co-production working groups before the building was ever realized. People come together saying the things they'd like to see in the building, what they'd like it to look like, how it can reflect the roundhouse feature. Um, you can see these are the early drawings that, that came from local people that went to the architect during those meetings. Um, and went into the design of the building. They also wanted a lovely garden, and we've got that. We've, you know, we started on the left there as Jeff and Christina uh, before it kind of, you know, just as it was getting going. This is more what it looks like on the right. Frankie's really involved. She's an incredible gardener, and we do gardening courses. And we're growing. We're trying to grow in parts of the garden, different crops that relate to the heritage and things we found. The parkland around the playground is full of stuff now. We had a wicker um, a tunnel, the trails going in, way marking, all done by the local Level Hill Fort volunteers who litter pick. Beautiful bench based on the swirly pattern from the glass, a glass bead that we found from the Iron Age and a viewing post where you can see other parts of Cardiff. Signs, so you know you, you people get a sense that this is an important place um, as well. Um, I'm working as well with loads with young people in the in the um, the centre itself, which has a really lovely flexible space. People wanted a kitchen so we could do food stuff. People wanted it to be a hall, not a kind of bog standard museum. But we have artifacts in there, a meeting room. It's fair, you can do all sorts there. We have things going on from dance classes through to you know weaving. Um, this is young, young people uh, designed a piece of artwork and a whole exhibition that went into the launch. Um, and this was the, the group I was telling you earlier about who came together from two schools, diverse schools um, and created friendships. Uh, there they all are there. And this is the transformation. It went from the Gospel Hall derelict playground to the beautiful Kaya Centre. And you're all very welcome to come and visit if you're ever in Cardiff. And I probably better stop there. I was going to try and uh, talk a little bit about a little bit about feedback from people, but I'll just leave these perhaps posted up. Um, these are some comments from 
some of our volunteers as part of our most significant change. But that's the end of my my talk for now. If you want to find out more about the project, um, please check out our website um, at kayaheritage.org. Wow, thank you. Dave, that is amazing. It's just fantastic. And things I'm taking out of it are a friendship and all that trust that you've built with the communities. And, and as you say, everyone learns. E everyone. And it's just wonderful. And there are already lots of questions coming through. Uh, one uh, questioner has asked, the art that you've produced, is that on display anywhere? Can people go and see it? Yep. Um, the, well, there's art on display always at the Kaya Centre. So we have um, uh, a really nice piece of, of, of art actually just outside. I don't go back there. Uh, this piece down here, which oh, was wow, that yeah. was co-created. Co and that, that's got what I love about that is it's got the faces of all the different people, many different people mm -hmm. who are involved in the project over the years mm -hmm. and lots of volunteers. You can see one ugly mug in there. That's me. Um, and uh, but but that's 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 literally just outside um, the Kaya Centre. We did a piece of artwork with the local school. So we, the, the new school went in and that was kind of a big deal um, uh, because the old school was was very run down. Um, but it was also a bit of a kind of, I don't know, um, you know, there was a, a difficult transition, I think, initially for especially for young people moving up there because it's a brand new school and stuff like that. So we got young people to make mosaics uh, like the Roman mosaics in small kind of things and they were brilliant and then we we got we worked with Paul we made a whole almost like constellation of these mosaics and then he placed them and it's in the foyer the main bit of the school when you go in mm. and it it's this constellation that surrounds a shape which is the triangular shape of Cairo Hillfort mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. there's this beautiful piece of artwork in the school that was co-created totally by about I think three schools many of whom and the kids who went there then did them some of them did it at year six so when they went into mm -hmm. the big school the next there year yeah. Here's my here's my mosaic on oh, the yeah, wall. Yeah. So um, you know, so that's another one. Um, we do quite a lot of temporary things as well, as well. So we do uh, temporary arts, uh, and we also had a social enterprise project. So we got local creatives inspired by um, the heritage, and some of them made like Bronze Age, well, the pots that were like Bronze Age axes, but they were made or little uh, hill for um, roundhouse bird houses and then we had a, a thing down in Cardiff market they have a Christmas market with a stall we had our own Kaya stall and we were kind of telling people about the project but we were also able to sell these um, artists works oh. and, uh, and the prices actually were all going back to Ace so we have pop-up yeah. and we have but but yeah if you, if you want to see some of the artwork um, come to the centre and you visit yeah yeah yeah, that's wonderful because because the very act of when you're making your whatever it is in the art project people are talking and developing those friendships and it's, learning and it, it's it, it's, it's a, you're absolutely so right else. yeah it's, it's it's fundamental glue to the co-creation yeah. process it's it's the process that's as important as the yeah, what yeah. comes out of it and that's such a, a perceptive comment so yeah and um yeah it, the other place to look as well if you want to check out art is you know we have a great and vibrant facebook page and if you trawl back through that you'll see lots of the art that we've done and and as i said the website as well so that's another if you can't get to cardiff then you can check out some of the things we've done there fantastic thank you uh now claire asks are you able to help other groups because I, I suspect and certainly going by the questions that are coming through lots of people will be listening and thinking oh i'd love to do something like this or we've got this amazing site or this group of people can you help have you joined you know, linked with other projects and yes things? yeah the answer to that is yes obviously within the capacity that we have but uh, you know we are yeah. very keen to do that and and we actually recently had a project called which we got some funding for uh, uh which ollie ran called kaya connected and we connected with two communities uh one was at pendinas in the west of wales in, in Aberystwyth, yeah, yeah, who currently yeah. have uh, doing a dig and that kind of came out a little bit of the kai connected and the we were exchanging stuff with them and that also involved art because we all each community mm, had yeah. an artwork that created and it went around and the, the, it circulated uh, and with Oswald Street, Old Oswald Street, who of course Oswald, are fighting yeah, yeah. Um, for, yeah, yeah. for against, um, development, against development of their their hill yeah. and their heritage so and and that was a very valuable because obviously we as ever it's reciprocal so you know you may be able yeah. to learn from us whoever that is but we may be able to learn from you Absolutely. and um you know so we're always open to that and and i guess my answer to that would be you know feel free yeah, to drop us an email great. um or, or contact us via i'm sure that so cba can get you in touch with us um and you know if we could if we could, even if we can just provide a little bit of advice or something then we'd be very happy to do so and we i, I know ollie's got big plans we'd quite like to do a kind of almost uk-wide hmm 
um, expansion of that Kaya Connected thing to connect with lots of other communities, maybe that are facing challenges, but that have really, really yeah. great heritage. And it doesn't have to be Iron Age. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it doesn't even have to be tangible, really. It could be, yeah. you know, migrant stories Story and stuff memories. like that. So, yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, that would be really valuable. Thank you. And I'm sure people will get in touch with you following this talk. Now, uh, someone has asked, are you planning to do anything for the Festival of Archaeology upcoming in a month's time in July? I'm sure you got Well, we'll still be digging then. So, yeah, <laughs> so uh, we're, we're currently digging. So that's that's our okay. thing. And, and we've got, um, we'll have a big open day coming up soon. The dig goes on till I think it's that first week in July. Um, so that's the kind of oh. so so that'll be the big reveal. But I mean, judging by the fact we've got a, a Bronze Age arrowhead in week on day yeah, three, yeah, yeah. I'm quite, quite excited nice. about where we're going uh, yeah, this year. Absolutely. So, um, but we do uh, every dig has lots of activities. So if people come along, um, yeah. often they you know they can get involved or you know uh, and, and in things especially things like fines washing and stuff like that. Mm. But um, but we always kind of nick our, our artists is on site and we always have kind of creative activities and stuff like that as well. And we involve that um so every day is kind of like a little festival on the dig um, yeah. and, um but we especially yeah, so i think have um the 24th of june is our our proper open day although like i say almost every day is open day but our official mm -hmm. kind of one that we're going to go cardiff yeah. wide on um okay. so yeah so i guess that maybe is a little early but it yeah it's all happening <laughs> and again if you follow on facebook or twitter uh especially facebook um the kai heritage page you, you'll get updates on what's happening with the dig and what's going on fantastic and someone else has asked are you looking at other aspects of the archaeology as well as the hill well, yes you're looking well yeah you hadn't expected to find bronze age and you're finding that but they wondered about the more recent world war ii that sort of thing or i suppose even the paper mill and things like that yeah, no, we are really interested in that. And actually, that was one of the good things that the back garden digs did that I mentioned earlier, yeah. you know, because actually most of those finds that came out were from the modern Ely estate. Um, and we had a whole range of things that, you know, uh, what's nice about those is they kind of connected to people's memories and stories. So, you know, um, uh, I know one one volunteer kind of had their grand, uh, they were excavating their grands and she, they were finding things that, she, you know, from when oh, she'd been I growing guess. up, yeah, um, yeah. you know, and there'd be like bottles or toys. And, yeah. and that kind of thing. So we are really interested in that modern um, story and, and more broadly, the modern story of Cairo and Ely as well. I mean, the, the actual dig site where we are now was, of course, the Ely race course um, and yeah. was an airfield as well. And so you, you saw oh. that we found an early 20th century coin. Yeah. Um, but, you know, the, so there's interesting finds in the topsoil of, 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 yeah. of that site as well. Um, and we also have done, as well as archaeology, we've done a lot of history-based projects. So yeah. I mentioned, I think, earlier... The, the intergenerational project where we looked at the origins of the social housing estate yes, um, yeah. in Ely and we had a, an exhibition at the Museum of Cardiff on that um, and that was really interesting because um, that, that you know three and a half thousand people came to, to see that exhibition about the modern housing state of Ely mm -hmm. um, yeah. uh, and many people from, from Ely and Cairo went down to that and they don't always necessarily go down to the Museum of Cardiff no. so um, so I think, you know, that modern story is, is very, very important. And we have films about that, too. So yeah. if you check out on YouTube as well, it's another place. We've got quite a lot of Kaya Heritage stuff on YouTube, um, films that we've co-created with local people and children um, as well. Oh, so um, yeah, because that modern story can it, it can be a springboard to the to taking um, it further back. Can't it if, if that person wants to check out on YouTube, Model Villages uh, oh. is our Kaya Heritage film. And it's basically um, it's talking about the the Eden Cairo estate as a model village an ideal utopia almost yeah, yeah. Uh, but yeah. also it it took part during the dig that we did on a planned medieval village so we're talking about that as well because that was kind of like a three orders where there was a church at one and then a manor at the other uh -huh. um, so maybe check that out if you're interested in that fantastic thank you someone else has asked how can you ensure the continuation of that youth involvement? Because of some, well, with some projects, it's that it, it's all that enthusiasm. But you've obviously been going now twelve years, so that's a testament to that. But how can you ensure that continues on and the income streams as well? Because that's yeah. hard, isn't it? The income streams is very hard. I'll tackle the first one uh, there. In, uh, youth involvement. So the schools are absolutely vital. I'm working closely with, especially with Cardiff West Community High, which is the, yeah. the local high school. And we have a really close relationship with them. Um, Martin is, is the uh, head teacher, uh, sits on the steering group of our, our project. And, and we also have scholarships for them. Um, we have a room in the school called the Kaya Suite. And, and that's kind of come about over, over time. 
So, so that's really, really important in terms of that. Then there's also um, ACE's work, ACE's youth work. So, ACE, yeah. because we're embedded with ACE and they do yeah. community development work, and a lot of that community development work takes place yeah. at the Kaya Centre. Yeah. Um, one of the key things there were some issues in 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 Kyra, you know, back down after lockdown, and we and so we ACE moved the youth work provision they were doing down to the Kaya Centre, and we've had also a I didn't mention it, but there's a great experimental archaeology children in need funded project, which sadly, and we're talking about income now, uh, just recently. Um, ended but that was fantastic because that was like another additional youth work night mm. but it isn't easy you're quite right and you know it's hard to get the funding we've come to the end of the national lottery fund now and we are in a uh you know we have got you know everyone's a bit little bit i'll be honest with you this sort of work is very very hard and you know yeah. we've had we've yeah. had you know i've suffered from a bit of burnout and, and other colleagues have too it's 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 it's, it's, it's so rewarding and it's yeah, wonderful yeah, yeah. but it's tough so we are in a transition phase now, but we do have, I think, I mean, we've got amazing potential in the Trilli field to do things there. And it's it's so close now that we have the Heritage Centre. So I think another big lottery um, grant mm. is, is within our grasp and they seem to be very positive towards us. Um, but they take a lot of work, don't they? But they take a lot of work. And I yeah. think, you know, and ACE, obviously all eyes are on Eden Cairo because of recent um, tragic events. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, and yeah. um yeah. With that, but also with that comes, you know, a chance to change things, you know, yeah. at least lasers people's uh, focus into the many yeah. challenges that there are yeah. and yeah. and hopefully more support can be forthcoming. Um, but ACE are quite stretched at the moment around that. So but but that said, you know, I mean, I feel confident that the university will continue to, you know, it has put an investment support, thus far. Yeah. And, I, you know, I feel confident that me and Ollie can try and continue that and make yeah. that that happen and the unit and we, we we use the center as a place for teaching and we that we then pay ace for the use of that so there are sustainability That's things built there. in yeah, yeah, yeah. For the maintenance of the building as well but yeah we, more project funding is 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 you know the key the key yeah. challenge for the next phase but one thing we are doing which is i think really positive and literally had a co-creation meeting yesterday about uh, is we see this the the Kaya center is becoming a real kind of learning hub for the community for in, a, in a broad sense yeah. you know from informal learning yeah. um not just for young people for all ages all sorts of learning presumably to as well, you know and at the university and other universities and i've had um you know support already in a message yesterday when i tweeted about this from the ou saying they're really interested in getting involved and yeah. loads of other learning providers so if we kind of apply our co-creation to that and get lots of learning providers coming in and offering things in the community at the Kaya center then we can make things happen sometimes mm. without needing to get those big grants as well. Mm. So, um, but it, you know, if you take that approach, but, but it is tough. And, yeah, um, yeah. Uh, and, you know, when you're in cycles of funding and anyone who's ever done any community development work or probably any heritage work knows that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And as you say, it's hard to get the funding in, but it's so, it's so important to keep things going and you can't not do it sort of thing you can't not do the work because it is so just listening everyone is yeah. saying how inspiring this has been to listen to and it, it is so so valuable and should be happening so much more really but but it is it takes a lot of effort and that yeah that's that's hard i think that's pretty much the end of the questions that have come through as i said everyone has said thank you very much for a fantastic just a little it's I'm guessing you're just scratching the surface here there's so much more that you could have said but it is fantastic and sorry I overran there. a bit but yeah I just, oh, no, once you get rabbit in <laughs> and no one has said he went on too long they're all saying it's fantastic so yeah wonderful thank you so much indeed babe that's wonderful and that's pass okay on all thank our all our good wishes to everyone else and keep thank at you. it if you can Thank you, Fiona, so much. Um, thanks, Claire. Thanks, CBA. And thanks especially to everyone who's attended tonight and all those brilliant questions and comments. And as I said, if you want to know more about our project, check us out on Facebook, check us out on our website and, and, and you know, and drop us a line if you want to know more. Wonderful. Thank you. Fantastic. Thanks a lot, guys. Everyone.